Welcome to the Marketing Stir Podcast by Starista, probably the most entertaining marketing podcast you're going to put in your ears. I'm Jared Walls, Associate Producer and Starista's Creative Copy Manager. The goal of this podcast is to chat with industry leaders to get their take on the current challenges of the market, but also have a little fun along the way. In this episode, Vincent and AJ talk with Nick Jordan, founder of Narrative. He explains how being in the weeds isn't always a bad thing and how his work is like a middle school dance. He also explains the non-traditional way he became a Mets fan. AJ is in a fun and upbeat mood. Vincent reminisces about a first date. Give it a listen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's another episode of The Marketing Stir. I, of course, am your host, Vincent Petrofessa, the Vice President of B2B Products here at Starista. Happy to be here, as always. Starista, who are we, right? We always start the podcast about who we are. In case you don't know us, we are an identity marketing company. We have our own business-to-business data, our own business-to-consumer data. We help companies get new customers by utilizing that data. Send us your first party data. We will enrich it, enhance it, model it to see who we can get as new customers. We also have our own DSP adster. We can do omni-channel. We do it all. Email me at vincent at starista.com. I always say that is how confident I am. I just gave all of our listeners my email address. And thank you for listening. We do appreciate it. And thank you for this next person. He is on this journey with me every episode. I'd love to introduce my CEO, my co-host, Mr. AJ Gupta. What's going on, AJ? Hey, Vincent. Hectic uh, day here. We're preparing for the board meeting for tomorrow, as you know. But yes. it's all uh, fun and upbeat. We're expecting to have a great quarter, which always makes these meetings a lot easier. Absolutely. I'm sure I still owe some slides. But yes, always a fun time You know, talking to the board. And yes, you know, at least we're going in. It's a great quarter, Q4, love it. And I'm looking forward to it. In, uh, in reality, I really am. I love talking to those, uh, that team there. Yeah, I what, think you just love talking in general. I do. I love talking. People always have to tell me to shut up, my wife included. She uh, makes a career out of it, basically. I don't know <laughs> even what that means. But yeah, also... I, I am excited for a variety of different reasons. A, because I'm always excited. You know that, AJ. Something seriously has to go wrong yep. for me not to be excited. But our next guest, a New Yorker like me, started out upstate New York, now lives in Brooklyn. You could have fooled me. I could, this guy, I swear like he lived in my neighborhood uh, my whole life here in uh, downtown Manhattan. And he's also, we're a proud partner together. It's, uh, we've had some partners on in the past, in the beginning. This is a new partnership with us. We're really excited. I also want to get his take on why, uh, you know, why he founded the company, uh, what prompted him, his previous roles. We have a lot of amazing things to talk about. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the founder of Narrative, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Jordan. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, AJ. Uh, Vincent, the, the mustache should have been the, the tip off that uh, I, I live in Brooklyn and not in Manhattan. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know. That was it. And also, you know, there's a little Western New York in that mustache, I think, too. There, 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 there is. It's the, the mustache is a little bit hipster, a little bit country. It's sort of, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it runs the gamut. But yeah, but you know what gives it away is the Mets hat. The Mets hat, you're like, oh, this guy is a New Yorker now. Because to proudly display a Mets hat, and you'll hear it on the audio, but you can also see it on our LinkedIn, our LinkedIn page as well as our YouTube page. He's wearing a, a Mets hat proud, as you know. The, the playoffs are long gone. The World Series champ is already crowned at this point when the podcast comes out. And it's not the Mets. And it no. has been the Mets for many <laughs> we, years. We, we, we could have said that even if the World Series hadn't have happened uh, at that <laughs> point. I, I actually earned my Mets uh, fandom through marriage. My, uh, my, my wife is a proud Mets fan, and growing up in Western New York, I, I, I really didn't have a baseball team to follow. And so, um, you know, in many ways, I married well. From a sports perspective, I probably could have done better. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if she likes the Jets or something like that, then she's, that's she's, not. She's, she's, she's Jets and Mets. It's, uh, oh, wow. It's, okay. It's, uh, 
it's a tough existence. That that is, you know, yeah. Usually that's a uh, a prerequisite on the dates I go on. It's uh, if someone, my wife is actually from Pennsylvania, and my first question actually was like, I, me as a Giants fan, I'm like, you're not an Eagles fan, are you? She's <laughs> like, she's like, I don't like football. I'm like, I'll take it. You're now a Giants Perfect. fan, and that's how I proposed. No, I'm kidding. Not on the first date. What are you crazy? No way. But uh, Nick, it is so great to have you here. Uh, I love that we are you know, kicking off a successful partnership with Narrative. We wanted you on the podcast even prior to that. It's just a bonus that we're a partner together. But for those of the viewers and the listeners who don't know Narrative, talk to us about Narrative and also the reason you founded the company. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so the company has been around for about five years, and, and our mission is to make it easier for companies to buy and sell data to each other. Um, as, as everyone's listening to probably knows that data is the new oil, is sort of the, the, the trope that, that has uh, existed for the last couple of years. And, and while that may be true, it's not easy to get oil out of the ground often. Uh, and, and so, you know, I've I've experienced a lot of, of companies over the last decade that you know have really interesting initiatives that are going to be driven on their ability to get access to data. And I've certainly met with a number of companies that have interesting data assets that want to monetize that data. And so, you know, you would think that you know things were just flowing, you know, like a you know, like in like oil, uh, you know, very seamlessly, but in reality, there's a lot of friction between the buy side and sell side. And so we really started the company to, to eliminate that friction. Um, and, and the reason I started the company is I, I lived the problem. Uh, my, my previous employer was a company called TapAd. Uh, and we were both a voracious acquirer of data. And then we would build machine learning models on top of the data. And then we'd sell the outcome of those models, which was just a form of, of data licensing. And we found that both sides were um, you know, impossible to, to really scale. And, and that was our core business. And so we threw people at it. We threw engineering resources at it. Like we did everything that, that we could and it was still pretty, pretty painful. And when I looked around at the rest of the ecosystem, I saw a lot of companies that that, that was not gonna be their core competency. And so how are they ever gonna figure it out in, in a world where you know, the people that were really, really good at it were still effectively really bad at it. And so the whole idea from the beginning is how do we build a software platform, put it in the hands of the buyers and sellers and have them think more about how they create value from the data versus spending all of their time just figuring out how to, how to buy and or sell the data. Nick, what, uh, what brought you into this uh, crazy industry in the first place? Well, I guess my, my background in digital advertising, digital marketing goes back to probably 2005, 2006. Um, I uh, moved to, to the Bay Area. I was, living in, I was living in Manhattan before I was a Brooklynite, when, when Brooklyn seemed like a different country, frankly, uh, it, out to the Bay Area. Uh, I was originally doing some consulting work uh, and, and I was traveling all the time and I said, hey, I've got to, I've got to find an office job. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm too old for this at the ripe age of 24, probably I said that. <laughs> um, and so I, was, I, 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 I knew nothing about anything. Like I, like it just, you know, I, I, I knew nothing. And I interviewed at a company that was called Look Smart. Um, probably a name that's not super familiar to, to most of the listeners, but uh, effectively, this was the, these were pre-Google days, or at least pre-Google being the Google we know about it today. And what LookSmart did is they, they licensed um, search advertising technology. And so if you went to Ask Jeeves, which is probably another name that isn't familiar to some people, it was a search engine that was based on a butler. If you went to Ask Jeeves and search for something, it was actually LookSmart on the back end that was powering the, the paid search results. Um, in any event, stayed there for a while, kind of understood how online advertising worked. I then went to Yahoo and spent many years there, um, specifically as they were, you know, innovating around uh, the programmatic advertising space. Uh, I then decided I want to come back to New York. I joined a startup uh, as, as the head of product at a company called Demdex. It was my big startup experience. I was, was so excited to you know, work at a small company and, and do all the fun startup things. We were acquired three months after I started. Uh, so I spent most of those three months doing the due diligence in the Adobe offices and not living the startup life. Um, and then from there, I went to TapEd where I ran product before I, I ultimately started Narrative. 
And Nick, what are some of the ways that you would describe as narrative revolutionizing data buying and selling? Well, in some ways, you know, what we're doing is transformational within the data ecosystem. In other ways, it is kind of mundane uh, and, and, and things that have been done in other ecosystems. So, you know, as I was thinking about the, the podcast today, I was thinking about analogies outside of advertising and marketing and data that, that, that would resonate with folks. Um, and, you know, the, the first example that came to mind were travel agents. Mm. Um, and, and again, I'm probably dating myself is, is not, a, not a young uh, a fellow anymore. But, you know, people, when they wanted to book vacations 30 years ago, would drive into town to the local travel agent and they'd sit in front of a desk with someone and they would look through binders of Caribbean vacations and going to the Grand Canyon and flying to Hawaii or Europe. And then that travel agent would do a lot of the legwork to figure out, okay, how do we go find flights for the family? And how do we book a hotel for the family? And then how do we you know, basically put this package together? Because there wasn't a great way to go directly to the airlines or go directly to the hotels. This is, you know, obviously predates the, the internet being what it is today. And so, you know, those folks served a function, like they, they, were, they were solving a problem. But as, you know, the, the friction of, of booking travel started to melt away, you know, the travel agent uh, industry, um, I didn't do any research on this, but I would, I would, you know, I would bet that it's probably not as large and successful as it was 20 or 30 years ago. And so, you know, that's kind of our same mantra is, you know, if you, the, there's always existed friction between companies that want to buy and sell data. The more that we can create um, workflows and standardization and automation that remove as much of that friction as possible. Suddenly you don't need someone that sits in the middle and, and, and you know, that person in the middle doesn't provide any value anymore, I guess is, is the real thesis. And, and at that point you can go directly to Delta or Marriott, or you can go directly to Strista if you're trying to buy data and you don't need to work through, you know, a, a, a bevy of, of middle, middle people. And, and that's, and that's really the goal. And it, you know, it happens, how do you find each other? How do you price things? How do you, you know, the technical integrations, you know, sort of the whole nine, there's, there's friction that exists everywhere. And our job is to find it and remove it where possible. And, and narrative is basically, it's working two elements, right, Nick? There's the, you would say the end user. And so your, your company is working with a variety of different advertisers and marketers. And then on the flip side, you're also working with a bevy of data suppliers. And, and joining that marriage together. And I once heard you say on a podcast, it's, uh, you wanted to make data so easy to buy, it's like your mother could buy it, right? Yeah, t totally. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've pitched my mom a number of times and I have not succeeded in getting her to buy any data, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I, you know, the, as, as a product guy, uh, I had an experience, this is a couple of years ago now, I, I walked into a, a McDonald's, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, um, egg McMuffins. Like I could eat an egg McMuffin for every meal. For I had one yesterday. I, I am jealous. And they're actually, they're actually fairly healthy as, as a little bit of an aside. Anyways, I walked into a McDonald's as, as I'm known to do some mornings. Uh, and instead of, you know, a counter with people taking my order and giving me my egg McMuffins, there was a giant tablet sitting in, in, in front of me. And like, you know, I, I'm not so old that I don't know how to operate, uh, you know, computers. I would argue that's kind of what I do all day with my life. But as I was thinking about, you know, all of the meetings and the planning and, and everything that went on before McDonald's ruled out those large kiosks where you could order food, you know, someone had to say, you know, grandmothers are going to walk in here, grandfathers are going to walk in here, you know, people that have never used a computer are going to walk in here. And, and the experience can't be that they see this big computer and then they turn around and walk out and, and go to Burger King, right? Like, it needs to be so easy that you don't need to be a technologist to know how to order an egg McMuffin. Uh, and, and what was interesting is basically what they, you know, what they did is they just put big pictures of everything on the screen. Like you just go and you go, you push the egg McMuffin and then it, you know, it says, do you want a hash brown with the egg McMuffin? And you, you know, you hit yes and then you're done. And so they, they really made it foolproof for anyone, no matter your background, your, you know, tech, technological skills, you know, anything to, to, to order their product, to, to buy an egg McMuffin. And in some ways, I think that's the challenge that we're trying to figure out with data is like, how do you make it so obvious for anyone that's going to participate 
that they don't need to go through a six week onboarding class. They, they don't need, you know, how, how do you make it so they could show up, not talk to anyone, understand what they want, find what they want, buy what they want and get it delivered in a, in a three minute period with, you know, no risk that they're going to do something wrong. And, and, and that's really what we're driving towards. And Nick, what's been kind of the biggest change for you going from working at some pretty large or established companies to running your own company? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing is the responsibility that comes with, with running a company. You know, when I was at Yahoo, even when I was at Tap, but I mean, I had teams and, and I was, you know, I very loyal to those teams and wanting them to succeed in their career and everything. But you know, ultimately, if I got hit by a bus or if I, you know, didn't come into work one day, everything was, was going to be fine. That's not to say that if I don't come into work at Narrative, everything blows up. And I don't think that's true. But, you know, I, I, I felt sick to my stomach two times throughout the process of, of starting the company. The first one was the first check that we took from someone else, right? I was taking someone else's money. And suddenly I was, you know, I, I feel a lot of responsibility to our investors that, you know, I'm not just, I'm not just screwing up my own financial status at this point. And the second time I felt sick to my stomach was the first employee that we hired because, you know, they have family and they have career aspirations and they have, you know, mortgages to pay and all of those things. And so suddenly, you know, um, us not being successful wasn't just hurting myself and my family. It was hurting, you know, a much larger group. And so, you know, that amount of responsibility is not something I think you, you fully experience until you're on a founding team or you are the, the CEO of a company. Um, it's not that you don't have any of those, you know, responsibilities and, and, and duties at other places, but it, it really amplifies it. And so that, you know, in some ways, the rest of it, like I've worked at big companies, I've worked at small companies, I've worked at company, you know, at kind of all stages, like if, we're kind of, we're just, we're running a company and there's good days and there's bad days and all of that. But the, the responsibility has been, you know, the, the, the huge shift for me. Got it. Yep. I, I would agree with that from personal experience as well. Nick, the, your day to day within narrative, right? Are you focused strictly kind of on, you know, product, the technology, walk me through a typical week. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of everything. We actually hired um, a COO, uh, going on about a month ago, his name's Steven Schwartz. And so certainly before he came on board, you know, I was, you know, doing everything, I, you know, not, you know, I, I was, you know, spending a lot of time on the sales and go to market side. I was spending a lot of time on the product and engineering side. I was spending a lot of time on sort of finance and, and, and sort of people operations. It was, you know, think of it as, you know, me having a, to, to bite off a bit of everything. I think with, with, with him joining, he's focused much more on the go-to-market and the people and the finance stuff, which has allowed me to focus a little bit more on the product and the engineering and, and, and investor relations and, and things like that. We actually had our board meeting two weeks ago. So, uh, AJ, I wouldn't trade places with you at least this week. <laughs> uh, give, give, give me another two months and then, then we can, we can sw switch spots. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that has definitely freed me up a little bit to, to, to be a little bit more thoughtful about, about certain areas. You know, I'd say I spend 50% of my time sort of big picture, you know, where, what do we want to be when we grow up? How do we think about, you know, access to capital and growing the team uh, and, and expanding the vision? And the other 50% is, you know, somewhat in the weeds, tactical stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I think being in the weeds is not always a bad thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I've had a number of bosses uh, in, in my career, hopefully none of them are listening, that, um, you know, didn't really understand how the business operated. You know, they would, they would make these grand proclamations and meetings or have these strategies that were just so disconnected from reality, you, 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 you couldn't figure out how to, how to bring them together. And so, you know, there's part of me that likes to you know, be able to dig into a code review with an engineer or, you know, sit down and help write the ideal customer profile with our, with our marketing team. One, so I, you know, we're all on the same page, but two, so I fundamentally understand what's happening in the business, how the business operates, and then that can be built into a, a much larger and grander vision. Got it. And, and getting back to how narrative is making access to data easier, 
Do you find that there's any friction between that and maybe some of the privacy concerns out there? Uh, we were recently talking on another podcast about Apple's recent um, phone update announcements. Sure. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, the changing privacy landscape is great for us because anytime there's disruption, you know, you have to find a way to combat this, that, that disruption. And I'll talk about that in, in, a, in, a, in a second, but, you know, the, we have customers come to us all the time and they're really worried about privacy. And frankly, they should really be worried about privacy. I mean, these are, these are laws that are being enacted. They're, they're um, somewhat nebulous in the way they're written. They haven't been adjudicated in any serious way. And so there's a lot of, you know, gray zone. Good, good for the lawyers, maybe bad for, for business getting done. But I think the one thing that I, I can tell all of our clients is you need to be diligent with your data strategy. And diligent five years ago when it came to data usually meant make sure in your contracts you're being indemnified by whoever you're working with, right? Like just if they indemnify you, you kind of don't have to care at that point. I'm obviously not a lawyer, so don't you know, listen to anything that I have to say right here, but, and, I'm, and I'm also paraphrasing, but that was you know, general, general practice is indemnification you know, saves all you know, the European regulators aren't going to look at your contract and be like, oh, you were indemnified, therefore you don't have to care anymore. There's a lot more um, uh, diligence that needs to be put into this. Um, and, and why it's good for us, frankly, is that our, our platform was built with transparency at the core, right? I said that we don't buy and sell data. It's sort of implicit in that is the buyers and sellers know who each other are. They can, you know, they can set their own prices, have their own transactions. They can talk to each other. And so, you know, one of the best ways to, to combat, you know, some of the challenges around privacy is to sort of look at your supply chain, uh, you know, your data supply chain and understand how the data is collected, what consent was gathered, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in many ways, it's good for us. Um, on, the, on the Apple stuff in particular, you know, we're not trying to circumvent or come up with any novel creative solutions for getting around the, you know, iOS 14 or iOS 14.0 one or two or whatever it's ultimately gonna gonna come out you know we think that the ecosystem is gonna evolve I mean we saw this with cookies already with Safari um, you know Google is supposedly going there with cookies in, in in the future you know our, our thesis is we're not gonna wake up one day and people are gonna be like oh we don't use data anymore remember the good old days when we had data like the data will continue to exist and, and evolve and it will do so in ways that are compliant and sort of, you know, figure out ways to work with the, the ecosystem providers that are out there. And our job is to make sure that we have the tools that, you know, when we go from one reality to another reality, everything doesn't just stop working, but that we can sort of adapt it to, to that new reality. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen this kind of in the opposite direction. When I was at, uh, I was at Demdex, which was acquired by Adobe and, and ran product for their data management platform, this was pre-smartphones, um, as crazy as that sounds. And so it used to be everything was tied to a cookie. And then suddenly there was this new type of identifier, a mobile ad identifier, and nobody's ad tech stack was you know, built to work with anything but a cookie. And so in that, in that example, they were actually expanding the amount of data that was available and it broke everything. In this way, we're sort of contracting the amount of you know, identifiers or data that's available or shifting what, what, what's there. And so I think the trick from a technologist perspective is don't, don't assume what the ecosystem is going to look like because you're going to be wrong and make sure that you build enough optionality in that whatever the common currency becomes by which you know, people talk about data, that your systems ultimately support it. Nick, how, how do you guys make money? I know you are transparent, but uh, for viewers that don't know your model, we'd love to kind of just understand how that happens. Yeah, we have, we have two um, revenue lines. So we do operate a marketplace. In that marketplace, we are not the buyer and seller. We're just, um, we're in charge of the, the marketplace dynamics, if you will. You can think of us like a like an eBay almost, right? You know, you've got the sellers that are, that are selling data, buyers that come in and buy it, we'll take a small fraction of, of the, the cost of the data that's bought and sold. Um, we have, uh, we also have a SaaS business, so we license software to, to buyers and sellers. And, and that was really born out of um, some interesting conversations we had with, with our buyers and sellers where they said, hey, you know, we would really love to use all of the tools that you built for your marketplace 
for direct deals that we do. So I've already gone and done a deal and I've sold my data and now my engineering team is telling me it's gonna take three and a half weeks before we can send the data to the buyer. And the buyer's saying they're not gonna pay me for the data until it gets sent to me, right? And they said, it'd be great if I could just put all my data into narrative and then when someone buys my data, I could point and click through the interface, send the data downstream to where it needs to go. And I could get reporting from my finance team so they know how much to invoice them at the end of the month. And I could get, um, you know, fine grain access controls to make sure that, you know, only the right people are able to access the, you know, sort of all of the things that you have to do independently. And they said, can, can we just use your software and not use the marketplace at all? Um, which was an intriguing idea to us. You know, the, the challenge with that initially was, you know, when your model is to take a percentage of the transaction, when you're no longer privy to that transaction, when you don't control the marketplace <laughs> dynamics, you know, I, there's a lot of data barter deals that happen in the world, right? So if you sell sure. your data for a ham sandwich, like I don't want 15% of your ham sandwich, <laughs> or, or, or maybe I do, but my, my board of directors certainly does not want 15% of the ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's when we decided, you know, to take almost what was a, like a, like a double click type model, you know, for the, the double click ad server business where, you know, they would go to agencies and sell them DFA, they would go to publishers and sell them DFP, but they were really just selling them software. So those, those publishers and those agencies could, you know, either sell media or buy media. Our, our SaaS platform is very similar where we're giving tool sets to, to help them buy and sell data, even if it's not through our, our marketplace. And, and over time, we've added a bunch of features to that and sort of expanded the purview of that a little bit. Um, but, it, you know, it's basically acting as folks system of record for, for either buying or selling. Yeah, I, I was trying to order Uber Eats the other day and I saw there's a new way for them to make money now. It's uh, if you order priority delivery, ah. you, you pay one forty nine more on top of the 15 other dollars they come up with. So there's a... I see the bigger companies spend a lot of time kind of perfecting how to maximize their revenue. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're actually rolling out right now is, is an app platform on top of our SaaS platform. And it, it allows for a couple of things. One, we're actually allowing third-party developers to start to create apps. Oftentimes people come to us and they say, well, I want to buy this data, but I want to, you know, I want to model it or I want to enrich it or I want to you know, quantify its, its quality, like, you know, all of these things that you want to do. Right. And, and for the most part, we're, you know, we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to be standing up and saying this data is good or, you, you know, we're not smart enough to, to really build machine learning models on top of the stuff. And so the, the application layer in many ways is allowing other people to come in and, and do value adds on, on top of the platform. Um, but what, what's interesting that your, your pricing comment made me think of is what we've realized is for a lot of these things, you can have like entry level versions of the product. You can have, you know, the, the medium, you know, the medium size and the enterprise version. And so, you know, we think there's a lot of ways to get people to, to, to use and buy and leverage data that maybe historically didn't because, you know, data has been seen as a B2B enterprise sale. Right. And we think there's a lot of opportunities in, 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 in the long tail, the torso to bring people into the ecosystem. If one, you can make it easy for them to, to access because they're not going to be quite as sophisticated. And if two, it can be priced accordingly and not just priced as if you're selling it to a Fortune 500 company. And Nick, since you're a product guy at heart, I'm sure you have a a lot of new ideas and plans coming up. So we'd love to hear some of the highlights of what we can expect for narrative in the next year. Yeah, so like I mentioned, one of them is, is broadly the app platform. You know, that on its own is, is, is pretty exciting. We, we probably won't see any third party developers on top of that until sometime next year. We're gonna be releasing a couple of our own uh, applications uh, by the end of this year. Uh, you know, just to one, you know, eat our own dog food, uh, and, and to, you know, have some proof points there, you know, again, people can really think about it as coming in and sort of either getting access to a utility or an easier way to, to buy or access certain types of data. And, you know, we think it, it increases the total addressable market. We think it makes it easier for us to use, for people to use the platform. We think applications can be much more solution driven. You know, early versions of our product were very much for power users, like, you know, it, you could do anything with it, but you kind of had to know what you wanted to do and you had to, you know, figure out how to, how to actually do it. Um, you know, this moves it to, you know, oh, if you're trying to solve a very specific problem, the application will be purpose built for that problem. 
So, you know, instead of just giving someone access to a bunch of APIs and telling them to figure it out, giving them access to a nice workflow where it kind of brings them through step one, step two, step three. Um, and so that's very exciting for us. And then, you know, the, the, the next big thing that's happening, uh, you know, early in, in 2021 is effectively letting people build their own, you know, white labeled uh, data storefronts. And so the, the easiest analogy for this is, is uh, you know, what Shopify did for, you know, retailers that are selling physical goods. We'd like to do for uh, folks that are selling um, data and, and, and data sets. You know, one of the challenges that we think data has broadly is it's, you know, it's a bit of a uh, isoteric asset, right? It's, well, it's electrons. It's ones and zeros that live in a data center somewhere that no one ever actually gets to see. Uh, and so we're focused on helping sellers of data basically build a brand around that data and then build a storefront that makes it just as easy for them to sell it as, you know, someone that spins up a, a Shopify store that wants to sell custom t-shirts they're making out of their garage. Uh, and so the trick, and we haven't, we haven't released it yet, so I haven't, can't tell you that we've solved the problem is how do you make it so easy and so turnkey that someone can basically set up a data store, you know, over the course of a, a, an afternoon versus traditionally when people try to set up data businesses, you know, they could spend a year between the hiring and the technology and the go-to-market planning and, and everything else. That's interesting. And, you know, we'll keep an eye out for that as a partner of Narrative as well. Nick, talk to me about, I always like to ask any uh, finders of companies that we've had on the marketing stir is what, did you think was going to be hard about starting your own company that wound up being easy? And then the flip side of that as well. What did I think was going to be hard that ended up being easy? I don't know if anything. Not a single, not even business cards, getting business cards made. Yeah. 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 I, well, let me, let me start with the other one and maybe I'll come back to that one. Yeah. Um, the thing that I thought was going to be easy that turned out to be hard. And in retrospect, I'm just an idiot. Uh, you know, the, the first 18 months of the business and is, it's not a business. Like, so, you know, we, over the first 18 months, probably hired five people. We had no product to speak of. We had no customers to speak of. We had no, I mean, we, we literally had nothing, right? Like starting a business is, is, uh, by definition, a cold start problem. Um, you know, you, you might bring in your experience and, and, and your knowledge, um, but by all, you know, for all intents and purposes, startups should not work. Uh, just when you look at the broader ecosystem, the competition, what's happening, it, it, it is really hard. I don't think I fully appreciated that. And, and, you know, the first 18 months, you know, it's hard to turn nothing into something, I guess is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and there were just a lot of, you know, you know, we would try things and they wouldn't work and then we would try different things and they wouldn't work and we would try different things and they would didn't work and it was just repetitive and it was really frustrating. You know, what, one of the, in retrospect, one of the biggest mistakes that we made, um, when I started the company, one of the things that I said is, you know, if, if narrative already existed, I would be a customer as tap ad, right? You know, I, I, I was experiencing a problem. I looked for a solution. A solution didn't exist. I said, you know what? I guess I just have to go build it because no one's checked all the boxes for me. We took some investment from existing leadership team members at TapAd. And so after Telenor acquired TapAd, they basically said, oh, you know, we have, you know, we have uh, rules internally at Telenor that if anyone invests in a company, we can't work with them. And so I basically took my, you know, ideal customer at that stage. And because I took money from the leadership team made them so they would never be a, a narrative customer. You know, I, I think one of the things you do when you, when you start companies, you have to find, you have to find shortcuts. You have to find ways to turn nothing into something. I think walking in with a sort of a guaranteed customer would have been one way to do that. Unfortunately for me, it didn't, it didn't work out that way. Um, but, you know, we, we, we made it past that stage, um, which is good. I, you know, I guess maybe one of the things that's been a little easier than I thought it was going to be has been hiring. Mm. Um, you know, I, this is some of the right reasons. I, you know, I think 
people really want to be able to have an impact on a company and it's much easier to make an impact on a small company than it is on a large company. I think somewhat for the wrong reasons, uh, you know, startups have been glorified in film and social media and press and, and all of those things. And so, uh, you know, occasionally we get people to come in and think it's going to be, you know, all fun and games and they find out that it's actually a lot of really hard work, but you know, we've, we've been able to find just amazing people to, to come join the team, you know, even before we had a fully fledged and fully formed story. Um, and that, you know, that, you know, those people are what have gotten us to where we are today. I like that. I like hearing that. That is our signature founder question. Our signature marketing stir question. I can't wait to hear this answer is a LinkedIn message. People utilize LinkedIn more than ever nowadays, I think. And the question we ask every guest, Nick, is, is there a message on LinkedIn that gets Nick Jordan's attention that gets you to say, I'll accept this request. I'll even respond to you. I'll set up a call. And on the flip side of that, is there something that you just absolutely hate about LinkedIn as far as the messaging goes that you never respond to? Yeah, I mean, I almost never respond to anything on LinkedIn. Like, I, I, it's just, it's, uh, it's I, I love it. And, See, you are a New Yorker now. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, ones, the ones that drive me the craziest, I get these emails, well, I get, there's two, two of them. One, I get more emails. One, I get more LinkedIn messages are the recruiters that suggest that I, you know, that they've just opened a um, senior manager of product management role at a series B startup that they really think I would be excited about. And would I like to come interview for the job? It was just like, I mean, I get it. Anyone could, anyone could put CEO next to their title on LinkedIn. And so that might not mean anything, but it, like, it just like the pure absurdity of it. Like I, I actually have a file of all the companies those recruiters work for, for and we will never work with any of those companies because if someone's sending a, a LinkedIn message that that's stupid, then they, they go in, in, in the blacklist. Um, so those are the ones I really hate. The, e the email equivalent of that, especially since COVID started or the people trying to, you know, we raised our series A recently and suddenly 18 real estate agents were reaching out about, you know, these great real estate opportunities they had in Manhattan and, it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe not now. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've, I've thought about emailing a couple of them back and being like, okay, you know, can I pay 10% of the, you know, of, of the square footage price? Because that's how many people we're going to be able to actually bring into the office. Um, you know, I, I, I'll give you the ones that I, 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 I will answer. So, you know, occasionally a, a college student will reach out to me directly about a potential internship or, a project that they're working on or, you know, something that they're clearly not trying to sell me anything, maybe other than themselves in, in, in a job, but they're, they're doing it in a way, right. In some ways, you know, coming out of school is like, is like starting a startup, right. You've got to create something from nothing. Um, and so I will respond to, to them often and, and try to, you know, figure out if they're a good fit for our internship program or if we have any roles that might be good for entry level or just give them some, advice of like, hey, you know, we don't have anything that fits, but you know, I have a, you know, I know the CEO, or CEO of another company really well, and I should introduce you to him because he might have something that, you know, I think when folks are, are, are trying to start their career, you know, they need, you know, they could use as much help as they could get. God knows I, I could use it when I started my career. And so I, I will respond to those. Okay. So yeah, there's some, some, that I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a bit of a, a soft heart for, you know, for a certain portion of the population. Yeah. <laughs> same. I, I love it. It's like a real estate agent. Yeah. We have some great property. It's like, read the room, read the yeah, room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Manhattan. Oh, geez. And, you know, after raising the series A, like the day we raised the series A, you, you get like 250 messages from people you've never heard of that, you know, are all trying to sell you something. The smart ones will at least wait three weeks and then be like, Hey, you know, I knew you were busy three weeks ago, but now, now is it time to sell you some real estate? And I still don't respond to them, but I give them credit that they don't just <laughs> send me the email, you know, 45 minutes after the, the announcements got on the wires. Yeah. Same, same thing happened to us. And the real estate ones are particularly good for COVID. Uh, you know, like, Hey, do you want to sublease a space? I'm like, no, but you can have my space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Nick, was there a moment with narrative that you have experienced where you were like, wow, we've really made it uh, was a particular deal or when you hired X number of people and you felt like we've really 
made a mark here? I mean, this is the wrong answer, and I'm sure no, uh, an endless stream of people will tell me this is the wrong answer afterwards, but not really. And, and part of that's my personality. You know, my personality for as long as I can remember, I guess my entire life has been, you, you clear the bar, you know, if we're thinking of this as a high jump, and then you set the bar an inch higher and you go back and you try to clear that bar. I, I actually don't take a lot of time to celebrate our wins at all, which is, which is problematic, um, less so for me, but for, for the team. You know, it, you know it, every employee is a person. Uh, and, and, you know, most people like to actually celebrate their, their wins and, and think back about all the great things that we've done. And it's really just not in my DNA. I've tried to change that, um, quite a bit. And, and I think I've been a little bit successful with it. And, and, you know, increasingly I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, the other senior leadership and the other people we bring into the company have that as part of their DNA, because that, that is definitely one of my weaknesses. And so, yeah, I, I, I wish there was a time where I, I mean, even when things go well, they're usually so anticlimactic. You know, you, you, the big deal that you sign takes four months and you kind of know like a month and a half before it closes that it's going to close. And so when it <laughs> closes, you're kind of like, just send me the DocuSign and let me go on with my day. <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the series, you know, the investment round seed series A were the sort of the same thing. It's not like someone just walked into our office and started throwing hundred dollar <laughs> bills in the air. Like that'd be exciting. Like that, that's, you know, an experience that I could get into. It's, you know, it's six months of, of spending time with people and walking them through everything. So yeah, the day the, the lawyers say that it's done and it's time to sign, it's kind of, you know, you're already on to the next step. Well, well true story. I, I had Vincent jump on a nonprofit uh, that I support because the last couple of, uh, I'm the chair this year and the, the meetings were so depressing and everybody was just like, I'm so tired. I'm you know, looking forward to sleeping this weekend. So I had Vincent come in just to uh, cheer them up. And that meeting in particular, the first five minutes were extra depressing because uh, somebody's mother or uncle had uncle. passed away due to cancer. So, and then I'm like, here's a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I know. <laughs> to it, cheer it, everybody it, up. Couldn't, I was like, oh my, the things I do for my CEO and friend, I was like, you know, uh, yeah, doing some jokes and they're like, hey, so-and-so, it's your birthday. That's a, how was it? They're like, well, my uncle died of cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, Vincent James. And I was like, what? Yeah, this that's is the a, worst that's introduction of all time that, 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 that's a tough setup our, 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 our head of product did um both stand up and um improv for a while and every time that he would do stand up like he'd be the next one to go out on stage and some professional comedian would come in which they would give priority to and so like he'd be ready to go on stage and they'd be like but first jim gaffigan yeah bill burr's here which, tracy which is, morgan yeah, they would just kill the room and then, you know, my, you know, Frank, who, who runs product for us, would go out there and, you know, he'd do a great job, but, you know, when you're, when you're going up against people that are, you know, are known entities and, 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 and legends, it's, uh, it's not a good opening act. That yeah, I, I would have loved a legend to, to come in and, and take in that <laughs> spot, but, 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 you know, but better, better than death, uh, for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah well, <laughs> you know, AJ, actually, you set it up nicely. And from what I understand and heard, they really enjoyed it. Yeah, and people laughed, but yeah, what a setup, you know. It so, was... so Nick, if you ever feel like uh, you're not giving enough uh, good news to your team, you're welcome to borrow Vincent for fifteen yeah. minutes. Oh, I'll, I'll make sure that I do it right around the time we're going to give some bad news. To yeah, it's <laughs> bad news. <laughs> and, it's like... going. <laughs> and then this guy you've never heard of and seen before. <laughs> we're, we're doing some December layoffs, but hey, we got a comedian. Yeah. Hey, right, exactly. That, yeah, What's that, the that, deal that, with Zoom calls? A, a, yeah, a, no. a, annual bonuses aren't going out this year, but we did hire this comedian to spend twelve minutes with us. A, a, exactly. <laughs> oh, good. So you got you actually hire and pay me. That'll be great. That's new. That's uh, I'll take that as a comic yeah. don't, don't forget your ceo percentage <laughs> I know, I, my finer state um good well nick uh, let's we're, we're at the end here but t talk to us about what you've been doing like what what activities you enjoy what have you been doing during during this time any shows you enjoy books that you could share with people yeah i mean i have been living groundhog's day for the last uh eight <laughs> months it, it consists of me getting up very early in the morning i usually get up around 3 30 um, I'm out the door by 4 a.m. I will go for a run slash workout usually for about two and a half hours. So back home somewhere somewhere just before seven. I then start working. Um, I'm on 
you know, Zoom calls all day, just like this. Uh, when my last meeting's over, there is a tiki bar uh, down the street from me nice. that I will walk and get a, a, a cocktail to uh, celebrate, you know, making it through another day of a, of a global pandemic stuck in a, in a guest room next to a Peloton. <laughs> uh, I'll then come home and watch some TV. You know, my wife and I just, um, this show's been on for a while, but we just watched season one of Alone. Uh, oh. I think which was on so History Channel or Discovery Channel. It's mm -hmm. you know, kind of a, a real life survivor. That's been pretty good. I'm a big West Wing fan. So the, you know, the West Wing re it's on Netflix now. special There's a came out, uh, yep. was really good. Um, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're social distancing. We're not really just going out and seeing all of our friends. And so it tends to be a lot of, a lot of TV, a lot of working out, a little bit of drinking. A lot of, lot of Zoom and Google Meets. It's I like it. Not, not yeah. more complicated than that. Work, working out, working, and drinking. I love that's it. Right. That's, that's, right. that's, that's <laughs> what, what more do you need in life? What, what more do you need? What better way to end the podcast? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time listening to us. Nick, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. That is Nick Jordan, the founder of Narrative. Check out Narrative. Check out Nick. Don't expect him to get back to you if you're going to LinkedIn message him. But if you're a student, do so. This has been another episode of The Marketing Stir. I'm Vincent Petrofessa. He's AJ Gupta. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks for listening to The Marketing Stir podcast by Starista. Please like, rate, and subscribe. If you're interested in being a guest on the podcast, email us at info at themarketingstir.com. Thanks for listening.